Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. On today's episode, I'm joined by Sifu Matt Stone, and we're gonna chat. And we're gonna have a good time. If if the pre-show is any <laughs> any indication, we're gonna have a good time today. If you're new to the show, or maybe need the reminder, Whistlekick.com is where to go for all the stuff, all the things that we're doing, the events, the products. You can save 15% with the code Podcast15. And if you want to go deeper on this or any other episode, it's Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Dot com. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming to the event. Thanks for having me. It was fantastic. Good. It was Good. really. It, re- it really was a, a, a great event. Good. I, I came you. in without a lot of expectations because it was a new thing. I'm like, because uh, you've listened to the show, so and you, I've listened you, to the show. You, you had no expectations. Expectations were you know. low. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, no, Amateur I just, hour. I didn't. I didn't know who was going to be there. I didn't know what to expect. Yeah. So I'm like, let's just go and see what happens. And and wow. Thank you. It was really, really a, a heck of a thing. Um, great people, great energy, great attitudes. Yeah. Um, it, was, it was a lot of fun. Looking for the next one. Good. Thank you. You know, and, and let, let's let's talk about my theory on why the free training day event is different. We can use that kind of as a, a jump off point to talk sure. about other things because you, you've been around a little bit. You've been training for a little while. A couple yeah. of years. Yeah. Um, I think it's ego. I think I accidentally stumbled on a format that does not invite people who would attend out of ego. Yeah. You know, no money. Yeah. Um, There's really no recognition beyond just showing up and having a good time. And we tell people, if you're not leading a session, we want you training. Yeah. So the people who show up are the ones who want to train. Right. And they're like, oh, I get to come to do all this stuff. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, and I think you're 100 percent right. Um, because if you if you have an event and you tell people who have belts of some sort, and you say, "Hey, wear wear a white one," then you know all of a sudden they're they're put off. Yeah. Because well, I want to be I want recognition. Cool, that's fine. Wear your thing, but like you did with the name tags. Yeah. You know, you're not Sensei Kyoshi Hanshi Renshi Soke Sifu Sigong Sitai. You're just Matt and Jeremy. Yeah. And that's it. And because no one's being compensated, you're here for the love of it. Yeah. You're not here because you're going to get some kind of kickback. It was fantastic. They're, again, the, the, everybody's personalities, everybody's attitude, um, the motivation that lasted throughout the day. I was getting a little tired. <laughs> <laughs> but everybody, it wasn't even, it didn't even look like people were trying to push through. It, it almost felt like when it ended, like people were like, no. And, and that's yet. and that's something I've noticed because, you know, I... I I love training. So yeah. I, you know, and, and I'm not disparaging anybody else's events. I yeah. still go to other events. I yeah. pay to go to other events yeah. because I want to support everybody who's doing all kinds of cool yeah. stuff, whether it's our stuff or, or not, doesn't matter to me. And one of the things I notice it's interesting to me is a lot of those events, the attendance fades through the day. Yeah. And you would think it would be the opposite, right? Like, yeah. oh, this is free. You know, I'm going to bail, bail after lunch. Yeah. And it's not. It's the ones where people pay, yeah. and you know you can watch the numbers trickle. The last sessions, it's a, it's almost an insult yeah. to be given the last session at it a lot is. of these events because you know you're getting the, the yeah. lowest attendance. Well, one of the one of the reasons you you touched on a thing there for a second, um, sort of hinted at it. Um, one of the reasons I try to support things that I have no connection to. Um, I have a group of friends. We all do Chinese martial arts. We're trying to create a community because that doesn't always exist. Mm. Um, schools are provincial. doesn't matter what culture they come from. They all have their own little area. And they're all concerned about their own student in, uh, income and, and recruiting new students because they, they're businesses. They, they have to. They got to pay the yeah. bills. Yeah. Like no hate for that. No, it's, it's just business, but it creates walls of division. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I've told my friends, when, it's something that I, I, believe very deeply is that when one of us succeeds, we all succeed because when one of us does badly, we have an instructor that gets in trouble for something. They're in the news. We all suffer. Yeah. So if when one of us fails, we all fail. When one of us succeeds, we all succeed. And you don't succeed as a group or a community without support that you don't have to beg and borrow from. Yeah. Right. It's just there. If you're not a martial artist, you see martial arts collectively. Yes. If you are a martial artist, you may not. You may not. I do. But it's still collective because the people that don't do it 
aren't in it. And if they're not in it, I mean, from a business standpoint, that's who we're trying to reach. And if all they know is a single unified facade of questionable people, mm -hmm. then when one of us fails, we all fail. But if, if they know, oh, no, I, I heard about this one school. And boy, they're just awesome. They're just so, so great with everybody. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Well, that filters off to the rest of us. Yeah. So when one of us succeeds, we all succeed. And yesterday was a fantastic success. I thought Thank it was you. amazing. Thank you. Let's talk about ego. Because it, it became very clear to me very quickly that you don't really have one. Well, you know, <laughs> married life will do that. <laughs> she, she's over there. Don't, don't say that too loud. The door's closed. It's so. true. Well, she might she might watch this later. <laughs> Not if I have anything to say about it. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know why YouTube won't ever work on this computer again. I don't or know. these three websites. I don't, I don't yeah. know. I don't know why it's blocked. <laughs> It doesn't take long in martial arts to see that we end up ego path, non ego path. I have my theories, but I suspect you also do too. Where does that come from? One of the first teachers I had was real big on throwing fortune cookie philosophy quotes mm -hmm. into our student term sheets and into the bulletin that he would put out. Monthly. Lucky numbers too. Not that far, okay. thankfully. Um, but through all the things, all the, all the sayings, all the phrases, all the out of context quotes, um, there was one, I, I think Dan Inasano was, was, has popularized something along the same lines, talking about keeping a beginner's mind. Mm. And my takeaway from those things was that, you know, when you think you've made it, when you think you're somebody, you probably ain't. Yeah. And if you're the person who's saying, you'll call me this, maybe you ain't really, you know, all that qualified to have that. And then I was in the army for a real long time, 23 years active duty. Mm. Kind of got pounded in my head that, you know, the alpha dog. Okay. If, if you have to say you're in charge, you probably ain't in charge. If you're the loud boy barking, you ain't the tough guy. Yeah. It's the quiet guy in the back corner. That's the one to look out for. And so I think collectively all that comes together and it's like, listen, you know, Dunning-Kruger, right? Mm -hmm. you, you, you don't know much, but you think you know everything. Mm -hmm. And you know a lot, and you realize how much more you got left to learn. And so I think you reach that, as you pointed out, that, that fork in the road. Which path am I going to take? How much do I think I know? I know all of it. We know where you're going now. Oh, I know how much more I have left to learn. Yeah. And uh, what was it? Uh, Plato, Socrates? Uh, the only thing I know is that I know nothing. Yeah. I had an IT business You've probably heard that on the show. I used to be in IT. And I found very quickly that I could lump my employees and later potential employees yeah. into one of two categories. They thought they knew more than they did or they thought they knew less than they did. Yeah. And the ones that thought they knew more were the ones that always got into trouble. Yeah. You know, they, they, they broke something. They did something that I had to go bail them out on. Yeah. And so I would, from then on, it was, okay. It was the ones that knew way more than they thought they did. And I would hire them because then instead of having to fix their mistakes, I just had to coach their self-esteem. Yeah. 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 So in my army career, they always say, trust, but verify, mm. trust, but verify. Yes. I trust that you did your job, but I'm going to go back and, and follow up and make sure that things got done. I started off as an infantryman. Then I was a cavalryman. And then I finished the rest of my career as a, as a military paralegal. And as a paralegal, like, there are other jobs in peacetime. An instrument doesn't really have much mm -hmm. to do but train, right? They're not actively doing their real-life job. Sure. As a paralegal, I'm doing my real-life job every yeah. single day. I have one chance to get it right. Because mm -hmm. if, if I get it wrong, that affects someone's real life in real time. And so, again, early on in that... I learned, hey, yeah, there's some stuff I know. There's some stuff I know really well. Don't take, don't take that for granted. And this other stuff that I don't know, you better be honest about it. You can always go research it. You always have time. But don't, don't put it out that you know something that you don't, because that's going to harm someone else somehow. A little bit, a lot of bit, a little bit, doesn't matter. Yeah. And so you're either, you either possess the self-awareness 
to recognize your own limitations and to work within your capacity and to grow into or beyond your limitations, or you fake it and everyone knows and somebody gets hurt. One of the things, and actually we were just talking about this out there that I find really interesting about this show is that when I started the show, I assumed that the ones most difficult to get to say yes to come on would be the biggest names. And that's not the case. It's the ones that are that layer down that want to be the biggest names. You know, and, and folks, if you go back, if you look at who's been on the show, it's, it's a who's who. Yeah. But the ones who have said no or no showed or wanted us to pay them, they're not names you would recognize. Yeah. Big fish in little ponds. Sometimes, Very little ponds. Sometimes not even big fish. Medium fish in a little yeah. pond, yeah. overstating their mm -hmm. purpose and, and impact. How do we improve that as an industry? You know, people are people. Mm -hmm. And uh, whether it's martial arts, law enforcement, the military. I worked in a hospital for a while. There, there are specific specializations in medicine where certain personalities gravitate. Yeah. And in certain, in certain, I don't want to say industries, in certain areas, you attract certain personality types. And when those certain personality types obtain some degree of authority, then they express themselves in really negative ways. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was, I was uh, reading some things. I, I've, I've fascinated with psychology and I was reading some things about military personnel and how there are a lot of military personnel who come from really abused backgrounds and they seek the safety of the military environment mm -hmm. because they know they can attain some degree of authority that will insulate them from ever being victimized again. Right. And I've read that previously about law enforcement as well. That makes sense. And so I think we get, I mean, we, we already know as instructors, we know we get people who come to us because they are being victimized mm -hmm. and they want to be safe again. I mean, that's a big part of the marketing that it we is, do. It is. And so if we know that's there, knowing that we have, and this may not be the nicest way to put it, these, these bullies in sheep's clothing mm -hmm. who come to us from an abusive background and I, and I mean, abusive, what, I, that can mean a lot of things, yep. Yep. but they're coming from that victimized background. They seek security here and then they obtain some degree of authority. And then they think there's something more than they are. And instead of remembering where they came from, and trying to be kind and compassionate and give back, they create a little fiefdom around themselves. And, you know, we, we've seen it too many times. We know it's a thing, yep. but I think it's just people. I, my feeling on this is that when we, we take those examples, the ones that I know personally, in every case, I can see that their instructor, if we take the context of military, or, you know, I, I would imagine in law enforcement or military, higher leadership, didn't address the problem when it was small. I agree. I think, I think there are some schools, and again, I'm not trying to like point a finger or whatever, but there, I think there are some schools that contribute to that kind of environment because they place undue emphasis on hierarchical structures. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of American schools have teachers who try to enforce cultural behavior that they've never experienced firsthand. Mm -hmm. And they say, this is how it's You're talking about in. someone like the respect that yeah, respect titles, titles, you know, just crazy displays of, of courtesy and, and whatever. And I'm not saying that those things don't have a place, but they, they try, they, they take it to an almost cartoonish level. Mm -hmm. And if that's the environment you're in, and, and you have been taught that this is how someone with this rank is to be treated when you attain that rank and people don't treat you that way. And you're already kind of not in the best headspace. Mm. And then I think it's a potential to create a, a, a somewhat toxic environment. And then you're just cranking out more people like that. Yeah. And because they're, they're craving it. They're not yeah. getting what they want because the instructor is yeah. not giving it. And so if I get to this point, then I can, have my own fiefdom yeah. as, as you and I said. mean, you know, where, where we see it in, in popular media, like that's Cobra Kai thing. Yeah. You know, um, until you watch the new series and then you see that, Oh no, Daniel was a bad guy, whatever. <laughs> but you have, you have these types of schools where the instructor for 
better or worse, has negative aspects mm -hmm. and communicates those to the students. The, the first school I was in was a little bit like that. Yeah. And not to a super toxic level, but we sure were full of ourselves. Did you realize that in the moment or was it only no, the no, contrast not later? Oh, well, not until many years later, yeah. many years later. Um, the, t the city I lived in, uh, the school we had was, was the only school that's type in town. Mm -hmm. And this was well pre-internet. And so we, we didn't know what we didn't know. There was no way to fact check anything. So as time went on and we became higher, higher graded, higher ranking, and we started interacting with people from other schools. And then we started moving across the country and interacting with even more people and going to tournaments and then internet. And then we're like, Ooh, well, hey. let me guess you, you were, you were at a school that Miraculously, miraculously, you had stumbled on a school that had the absolute best fighting system. What? And and your instructor was the best in the world. What? You've been you've been you've been looking me up. Kind of kind of <laughs> what kind of intel you? Got I, I do I do I do tons of. <laughs> I hire private investigators. So you thought I invited you yesterday to come on the show? We've been yeah. planning this for six months. I got it. I got it. I got it. No, th that's yeah. That's pretty much what it was. And because. Again, you know, 80s martial arts were 80s martial arts. If you know, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that was very much what it was. It was, and it was, it was kind of soft marketing. It wasn't like, you know, defeat your attacker in 13 moves. It wasn't quite like that. But once you started training, you know, we, we kind of got conditioned to view other people from a very judgmental standpoint. And we were the litmus test of what good was. Mm -hmm. Could we throw down? Yeah, we could throw down. Were we the best? No. Demonstrably not. Mm -hmm. um, did we have successes? We sure did. Um, were we the most authentic? Were we the most legitimate? Demonstrably not. Mm -hmm. And But we didn't know that until we did. Because you didn't have the contrast because you were not, probably not, um, thick walls. You do thin. not cross train. You know, Pretty everything else is junk. It was, to to that instructor's credit, when when early on anyway, when you reached like black belt level. He was like, go out and get a black belt and something else. Oh, which was cool. That, that is unexpected from what it you've was, said. It was, it was. But by the, that point, you were already steeped in the understanding that probably anything else you studied was going to be inferior. Okay. So most of us didn't do that. Mm -hmm. and it wasn't a requirement requirement. It was just a strong encouragement. Was it, was it because he wanted you to learn other things or because he wanted you to go beat up, so to speak, people in other schools? I don't think it was the latter okay. and it wasn't so much because he, he wanted us to learn other things. It was a contrast and compare. Mm -hmm. He was, he was very uh, convinced of. Okay. He drank his, his own Kool-Aid. He did. He did. Um, and again, like early on, we could, we could bang, we could bang. Um, but we weren't the best. We weren't, we weren't nearly as good as we thought we were. Okay. Interesting. Why did you start training? So I was one of those kids who, had been bullied and beat up and picked on and socially ostracized most of my life. And I wanted, I, I couldn't have, I couldn't have articulated it then looking back. Um, years of therapy helps with this. It does. Um, I, I wanted to protect myself, not physically. It wasn't about the fighting. It was about, I wanted to have some sense of, self-respect and self-empowerment and self, uh, I don't know. I wanted to improve my self-image. Where did your understanding of martial arts would give you that come from? <sighs> Again, it, it, it wasn't, it wasn't a fully articulable yeah. position at that time, but yeah, I'd seen, you know, this was, I started training in 85. And so, you know, this is the era of enter the ninja and, you know, Shokosugi was on the rise. Yeah. Um, Van Damme uh, was, was becoming popular. Um, and so you'd see these movies and you saw these characters who were unassailable. Mm. And yeah, the bad guys come at him and rah, 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 they talk smack and whatever. But the good guy was just, just didn't bother him, just fell off him he like water off a duck because he was, he was confident enough in his own ability to protect himself yeah. that that didn't bother him. And that's not where I was. That's not where I was. And I wanted to be, I wanted to have that. So that's, so I started, um, I went to one school, uh, thinking that that was really what I wanted. 
And I went there and I met the instructor and was just absolutely shocked at how that person talked to me and my mom. I was 16. I wasn't, I didn't drive there. Um, and the way he talked to me and my mom, I was just like, at 16, I knew that was not okay. Talk to you in, in, in what way? Um, arrogant and rude and, okay. and, and coarse and abrasive and just like in my face about how I can't this and I can't that. And I was like, it, it sounds like his attitude was, you would be lucky if I allowed very, very you to play so, with me. Very much so. Um, and I was just really put off mm. by that. Um, so I didn't go to that school. And then a few weeks later, uh, I, I was at the, the one and only martial arts supply store that was in our town. And I went there, and I'm an idiot kid. I don't know nothing. So I'm asking the clerk, I'm like, hey, how do you find a martial arts school? And he looks at me and says, I don't know, you try the phone book? What? They're like real businesses and everything. They have phones. Who knew? No, I hadn't tried the phone book because I'm a stupid 16 year old kid. Well, and because if most of your understanding of martial arts in the early 80s came from movies, then most of the schools were secret and you had to find yes, them. Yes. And they were intentionally difficult were, to find. Their hands and... were licensed as weapons. You know, it was a thing. So it happened that. The, the school I ended up joining was, <clears throat> there's a strip mall, two, two strip malls, um, one slightly higher on the road than the other. And he's like, yeah, just go down. There's a guy down there. He's opening a new school. I went down there and went there every day for seven days and just sat there and talked to him and helped build the railings and helped mm -hmm. put down carpet and whatever. And I was like, this is where I want to be. Mm -hmm. And I stayed with them for about 20 some odd years, 22 years. Um, and eventually left for a lot of, and, and this is the school that you're, you're hinting at was maybe a bit ego forward, yeah. but 22 years. That's, yeah. See, and that's, that's a rare story component that we have on the show. As you know, it's usually people figure that out much earlier or they never figure a lot out. of head injuries, man. A lot of head injuries. I'm not <laughs> the brightest bulb in the box. As you said earlier, you, you could bang. I, so you're, you, you took could. some shots. I got a knot on my head from where I used to break concrete with my head. Seriously? Yeah. 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 Don't do that. We build we to. build buildings out of concrete for a reason. <laughs> Just say it. Roads, you know, multiple story structures. Not supposed to be trying to put your face through it, but I did. Um, and, and yeah, it was. I mean, I was with them, and I really thought, I really thought for for most of that time, that it was the place. Mm -hmm. um, I, I I didn't drink the Kool Aid. I jumped in a bucket of it and hung out. And a lot of our senior students. Uh, fell away very quickly mm -hmm. as their eyes were open to the reality of it. And they kept trying to take me with, and I'm like, no, no, it can't. No, no. And I was just very resistant to it yeah. because I'd, I'd started it so early. Yep. And a lot of them had started when they were not young adults, but in their twenties and thirties, they had more life context yeah. to weigh it against. But I had started as a kid. Right. And so I was like really invested in this. It, it had been a part of my personality for so long. So I was very resistant until I ran headlong into some of the problems. And then I was like, I'm going to have to step away from this. Um, I don't want to put you on the spot. Are you able to articulate anything that might be more concrete for folks? What we're willing. So, I guess, yeah. So, you know, there, there are a lot of, there are a lot of martial arts instructors who like, yeah, I'm a, I'm a paralegal by trade. Mm -hmm. So frequently I have to tell clients, Hey, I'm a paralegal, not an attorney. I cannot give you legal advice. Mm -hmm. And they don't always understand that. They're like, yeah, but you, you work here and you know, you know the answer, right? It doesn't matter that I know the answer. Okay. What matters is that I know my role and there are limitations inherent in that role. Martial arts instructor is not there to be your life coach or to help you through your divorce or to tell you the right life path to pursue. It's one thing if you've lived a really successful life and you have something to contribute and not even successful. You could be a train wreck. That's fine too. And you can say, Hey, this was my mistake. Don't do that. Like breaking concrete with your face. And you can, you can speak to that from experience. It's another thing when you really presume that your job is to be some type of guru to other people and you start telling them who to vote for mm. and how to express their own personal belief systems. What is right? What is wrong? what you should or should not believe in, who you should or shouldn't vote for. You're stepping well outside those boxes. 
and I, I'm not the person who does that. People ask me questions. I'm like, are you asking me as Sifu or are you asking me as Matt? Because hmm. I'll talk to you one on one. I'll say, hey man, when I did this thing, this may or may not be applicable to your situation. Yeah. But here was my experience. Do with it as you will. Yep. If I start going well, Jeremy, I think you should. Oh, see, stop, 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 full stop. You're crossing a line. You're crossing a boundary. And since I'm not that kind of person, when I ran face first into that and pushed back and got pushed way back harder, I'm like, okay, cool. I'm going to have to pick and choose who I associate with. And that's not them anymore. And it was regrettable because, and I'm still friends with a ton of people. All of us are no longer associated with that school. Mm. Um, literally around the world. We're all very good friends because we were all super tight but we're all not affili affiliated with that school anymore. Hmm. Does that school still exist? Not in any appreciable way. No. The instructor still teaches. He has a handful of students, but it's not what it used to be. Hmm. You know, you, you bring up a really interesting point that I don't know that I've thought much about, and that's this idea of being in a, a position of martial arts leadership. And even if you have advice and information, that what I'm hearing is conveying it as a peer is acceptable. You know, for us to, to shoot the breeze, to talk as two human beings, fine. And I agree for, for one of us to speak authoritatively at, because of a student-teacher relationship, unacceptable. And yeah. Well, it speaks to the point that you brought up earlier about the free training day. It's ego. Yeah. When you really think you're it, you're going to make some mistakes. When you realize... You're not it. Tag, you're it. If, if you know you're not it, you are, if nothing else, at least you're being intellectually honest. Hey, uh, Jeremy, listen, uh, have you ever, uh, have you ever broken a leg while water skiing? And if you do, what do you do? No, I've never done that. Well, I think what you should do is, well, okay, if you've never done it, then why are you giving me advice on it? You know, that's kind of an absurd off the cuff example. It, it but is, but it, it's, it's a great example because it's, uh, and, and I get pushback from this just in the, in the wider world. Don't take business advice from people who have never been in business. Uh, Which is a crazy thought, really. Like, why? Don't take health advice from people who are unhealthy. Mm -hmm. They might be able to tell you what not to do. Mm -hmm. and, and that is advice, and I, I guess that's acceptable. Sure. But don't, you know, if you look at someone who's, clearly unhealthy in whatever way you right. you know and they're like i think you should do this well, why aren't they doing it right did you read a book was that what you, where'd you get that cracker jack box doesn't mean that they're wrong but it doesn't mean that their advice is authoritative yeah again as a paralegal we get we get clients that come in and we tell them things they don't necessarily want to hear it's not my job to tell you something to make you happy right? i'm dealing with your legal concerns your legal mm -hmm. issues I'm here to assist my attorneys in advising you on the proper legal course to resolve your situation. Mm -hmm. Resolve doesn't mean make it go away. Resolve doesn't mean you walk away happy. Resolve may mean you're going to be out of pocket for a long time. And then they get mad at us because we're, we're wrong. Okay, number one, you came to us. Number two, they're attorneys. But by all means, you know better because you watched a YouTube video. Because they picked and, and chose the YouTube videos until they yeah. found the one that said that what they, they wanted. They cherry pick hear. something that that it, confirmation bias is a thing. Yep. They cherry pick what fits what makes them feel good, and then they run from there. Yep. And and again, martial arts ego. You get people who think they're more than what they are, and they're going to say and do things that reinforce that same perception. And if you push back, they push back harder. And, and again, I have a bit of a fascination with psychology. I am by no means an expert, um, but I've read a, a small amount on how that's kind of indicative of their mental mm. makeup, that the reason they push back harder is because like they've really, they really have sipped the Kool-Aid real hard and they really believe this is them. Yeah. And when you begin to shatter that for them, like that's like deep inside of them, that's really hard. And so they push back harder to reaffirm what that is. And at the end of the day, they're only hurting themselves because the people around them see what happens. They see that toxic behavior and they're like, Oh, 
I'm not, we're not doing this. And then they wonder why. Yeah. So when you left that school, mm -hmm. did you take a break or did you instantly find a new school? No. Um, so I was on my own for a while and I was just, I, I, I didn't stop practicing, but I stopped practicing the bits that were real unique and specific to that school. Um, just put it behind me. And I have for, for since 2008. Um, but then I did get involved with uh, Dr. Kelly Warden and his Natural Spirit International uh, program. And Kelly is an amazing human being. And, you know, we, 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 we toss the word master around a lot. I, when that man's got a stick in his hands, you know what mastery looks like. Um, and I, I, I really enjoyed my time with him. Uh, and then I moved because I was living in Washington at the time. I moved from Washington to Hawaii. And I spent some time dabbling here and there with some people. Um, and then I moved to Maryland, which is where I found my final teacher, mm. um, Sifa John Scott, in the Chen Pan Ling family lineage. And that was it. I found home. How did you know? Because you're saying it like it just, it was clear very quickly. So, you know, when we talk about, when we talk about ego, uh, Seafood has, Seafood John Scott has very little ego. He, he is a very self-effacing man. He is a very kind, humble, generous man. Mm -hmm. Um, it took me a couple weeks to find the school because the school, like it's in a strip mall or it was, he's got a new school now. I haven't seen it. I've been back to Maryland in a while. Um, but it was in a strip mall and there, there was no big sign. There was an eight by 11 plastic plaque that had his logo and the phone number next to this rusted blue door and you couldn't see either of it from the street and i went there i said hey can i come by school and meet you said, yeah come on by such and such night and i drive by and i i couldn't i didn't know that's where it was so finally we made arrangements and he came outside and flagged me down I'm like all right cool so we we walk go through the door walk down this back hallway and i'm like this is weird and we go back into this back room that is evidently a storage room for, uh, or would have been a storage room for the, for the stores that are in the strip mall. But he was renting it uh, from the strip mall's owner for his school. So uh, no windows. No windows. <laughs> one door. Like, you know, if something goes sideways, there's only one way out. So it, it is like um, the schools we were talking about at the beginning where you had to, you had to hunt them down. Yeah, you know, yeah, very the 16-year-old so. you was right. You were just premature. Well, and. I was stationed in Japan, I was stationed in Korea, and I've seen these little back alley schools that were like a thousand times more legit yeah. than some of the, the big fancy mini mall, you know, <clears throat> for lack of a better word, McDojos, right? That still can have great things. But these schools in Japan and Korea were not glitzy. You didn't know, and you didn't know unless you knew someone who knew. Yep. Like you, they wasn't even asking around. They certainly weren't in a directory somewhere. You weren't making a phone call. They were not on the internet. You'd be lucky if they had power, whatever. So I walk into the school and I look around. I'm like, I'm like this is, this this feels right. Mm -hmm. And he asked me. He says, "Well, what do you what do you want to start working on? What are you interested in?" I'm sorry, what? That's a weird question. It was. And so I already knew that he did, you know, Shaolin Chuan and Jingyi Chuan and Ba Ba Zhang and Tai Chi Chuan. I've always really liked Jingyi, so I'm like, can we start with Jingyi? Yeah, sure, no problem. Show me what you know from the previous school I was in. And so I do. And immediately he just starts correcting mm. everything I'm doing. And I, I had this real strong feeling that I'm like, like, wow, I, I don't think I know anything. The light bulb comes on. And we start working on that. And then he shows me, not just positioning me, it's not just do this because it's wrong. It's wrong and here's why. And again, we thought we could bang. We thought we knew the stuff despite going to tournaments where authentic instructors of these styles had come up and said, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. And he starts showing me why. Now he's, Sifu John's a big man. Six, four, six, five. He's a big, tall guy. He's a big man. But it wasn't him just using muscle. Like, he put his hands on me, and, and I still maintain to this day, he's like a sheet on a clothesline in the wind. You ain't touching him unless he wants you to touch him. I've trained with people. And you don't want him to want you to touch him. We did, we did push hands at the end of that class. And that's where I formed this sheet in the wind kind of mindset with him because we did push hands and I was 
oh, I was trying hard. I was trying hard. I couldn't get my hands on him. And the few times he that wasn't I actually trying. touched him, no, he wasn't. The few times I actually touched him ended up in literally me sailing across the room. I was like, I'm done. I'm done. This is, I'm getting goosebumps yeah. talking about it. I was like, I'm done. This is what I've been after. And I've been with him since uh, 2015, 2016. No, no, I got to Maryland in, so I retired in the army, Reti retired from the army in 2015. So I've been with him since like 2013. Okay. So there, there was a, something you mentioned that I want to go back to. And this is an experience that I think a lot of us have had, and we don't really talk about. I felt like I didn't know anything. Mm -hmm. We meet someone, we take someone as an instructor, or we go to a seminar or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's one thing to say, okay, here's an area that I know I need work. Yeah. But it's the area that you didn't realize you needed work yeah. and something happens and exposes it. And that happened for me when I joined the Superfoot organization. Yeah. yeah. And it was like, and for me, yeah. at the first opportunity, I went in the bathroom and I sobbed because I'd been training yeah. for decades and realized things that I didn't even know were wrong or wrong. Yeah. What was your experience like in, on that? So, you know, I left the previous school in 08. And when I started training with Dr. Kelly, um, it was a lot like that. Like I did, I wasn't sad. I was, I was stoked. I learned more from Kelly Warden in under a year mm -hmm. than I had learned from the previous school in the previous 10. I had learned more from Datu about what I did before in the time with him. Oh. than I did in that school because natural spirit international is not, I mean, it's a style. Yeah, but it's not a style. It's modern Arnis and Jeet Kune Do and all these other things squeezed, shaken, poured out. There you go. And there's a personalized aspect to all of it too, because you know, I, I met people there that were karate stylists and Kung Fu stylists and nothing whatsoever or straight up military personnel. So everybody comes, approaches it from a different perspective mm -hmm. and the material is, is, a template that you lay on top of what mm -hmm. you already know. And the, the insight that that provided uh, the stuff I didn't know stuff. I didn't know. I did know. It was just amazing. It, it was very, it was a very joyful yeah. realization. Um, then it was another seven ish years, 2013 from 20. No, so five years later, I meet see with John Scott and it was, it was a sense of relief because I'd already had all that time to grieve the lost years that I had to set aside. And I was already, and I'm still, I'm not going to lie. I'm still a little miffed that hurts. those, those years were, I don't think they were wasted, wasted. You know, um, I tell a friend of mine and I, we, we have a, a saying that all XP is good XP, mm -hmm. right? All experience points are good experience points because you're still learning. You're still learning. Even, even bad things teach you things. But I invested 22 years of my life in that school. Mm -hmm. Where could I have been had those 22 years been invested with my current teacher? Now, that's not a realistic thing because I didn't meet him until later. Sure, sure. But it's still like I still have that regret. But, but and, and if I may, and I, I'm, I'm saying this less about you and more because there may be some folks out there. Sure. Would you have been looking for these other folks? would you have been as motivated or would you have had the context to know here's, here's the puzzle piece that I want to insert here without that 22 years? No. no. And, and I, and, um, and, and, and so I'm, I'm not arguing because yeah, I yeah, get no, it, yeah, yeah. but I, I don't want folks out there to feel like that time was wasted. No. And, and could it have, could there have been a, a, an instructor or a school or a method that got you closer to where you wanted to be? Yes. Yeah. Would you have known where you wanted to be without it? And I think the answer is often no. Yeah. And it's, it's you know, another bad analogy. You can invest in these things and make $50,000. And then you find out when you cash in that 50K, 
that if you would have invested in these things, you might have half a mil. Right. How many people, you've probably heard him say, you know, I could have invested in Apple back in the day. Right. Right. Well, yeah, everyone. But you had have. no perspective to understand that Apple was going to be what Apple became. Right. So you can you can look back. And that's why I say I have, I have some regret because I'm like, wow, what could I have accomplished? Because mm. I'm old and broken now. My wife says so. <laughs> um, what could I have done when I wasn't? What could I have done when I was younger? What could I have put into the work to achieve by this point? Um, but at the same time, I have some I got great stories and great experiences and some great friends. And I don't, I don't regret what we did. Even the concrete breaking with my dome. Um, I don't regret it. I, I just wish like having the 50,000 versus half a mil, I would really love to have been able to invest and get a half a mil, but I still got 50,000. So it's still, it's still a win. It's, it's bittersweet, but there's no way, as you said, there's no way I would have known until I'd had the experience to be able to look at it and think negatively of it. And without that experience, I wouldn't have been prepared or enabled to see the value in anything subsequent to it. Yeah. One of the things that I've been working on personally is less so martial arts stuff, but we can close up this point with this. If I'm going to blame someone for something that has happened, I also have to give credit for all the good. You do. You do. You, you can't, you can't pick and choose. You can't, mm -hmm. you know, I'm going to take all the good and not give you credit, but you know, just you're. And, and I, I, I have some materials that I provide to my students and my prior life is part of that. I, and I give credit to that teacher for the things that I did learn. Um, am I thrilled at the way everything ended? No. Am I thrilled at what things that I may have discovered later? No, but I learned some really valuable stuff. Um, I, I learned how far I can push myself yeah. and, and think that I've pushed myself to the limit and then realize, no, you haven't. You got way more in the gas tank left. Keep going. Yeah. I've learned so much from you know, technically about martial arts and about the community. I, I've learned a lot. So there are a lot of good. Don't please don't misunderstand me. I, I while there are things I don't like about that experience, I still give credit where credit's due for the for the beneficial things that sure. I did come away with. So you mentioned students. You have a, a school. Um, yeah. So we we have a, a small group in Enumclaw, Washington. Um, I've got about a dozen students there. I also teach on joint base Lewis McCord through the Morale Welfare and uh, Recreation Center. Mm -hmm. um, I've got 12 to 15 students there. Mm -hmm. um, I teach for free because this is how I do something for the community. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have many other skills that are marketable. <laughs> You know, you don't always come out of the army with stuff that's directly applicable mm -hmm. to, to, to job skills. Um, so I work for the federal government as a civilian employee. And then a couple times a week, I teach on post to give back to the military personnel and the retiree community. And then I teach in the town I live in. Mm -hmm. okay. How? Mm, okay. Your military experience and your martial arts experience, because martial arts came first. Right, unless you really lied on your paperwork. No, no. <laughs> I, I love hearing those stories, like World War II, yeah. like you know, fourteen-year-old yeah. signing up, like yeah. that's a trip. I cannot imagine that, because what did you say, twenty-something years of service, twenty-three active. 23? Yeah. I, okay. I went in in eighty-seven. Okay. I can't imagine that you've got that much martial arts experience and that much military experience, and both didn't improve the other. What did you? What from your time in in your military? experience have you brought into your martial arts and what did you bring from your martial arts into your military service? so the the army is a really rough life at the best of times and just to uh, let the pardon me for interrupting yeah. just to let the audience know um we're we're in a, in a school and there is a class that is about to start because um i'm not always the best at holding to timetables with when episodes will start and finish and um, yeah, this is the fourth that we're doing today. And so, yeah. So if you hear some noise, that's why. Please continue. <laughs> no, it's all good. Um, the, the, Army, the Army instills a lot of things, whether you know it or not. Um, it, it inoculates you against hardship. Mm -hmm. Chinese martial arts, they say, you know, eat bitter, taste sweet. Military service, we don't have sayings like that. We just say, suck it up and drive on. Um, 
and, and you realize if, if you're willing to listen to the lesson, and that's a big one, when you're, when you're first termer, first two or three, four years, you're not listening to anything. You just think life sucks and you made a bad decision. You get past that, you pay attention, and you realize that our training is, is done very specifically for very certain. We, we have outcomes we know are going to happen. We do things to you to teach you how far you can go, to teach you to rely on yourself, to teach you to endure hardship. My first teacher said, um, pain is inevitable. Suffering is optional. The Army doesn't tell you that, but they sure as hell let you know. Yeah. Um, I've gone... The, the, one of the last uh, exercises I did when I was in Korea back in 89, 90, um, we went the better part of a week with no food and no water. The temperatures were freezing at night and blistering during the daytime. So I found out just how far I could go. Mm -hmm. I, I went, I went uh, three days without food, or no, three days without water, four days without food. And this is while we're doing 20 to 30 miles of travel every day. Mm -hmm with 80 pound rucksacks up and down the mountains of Korea. At what point was I ever going to do that on purpose? No one willingly goes, you know what I'm going to do? I'm not going to eat for the next three days. Sounds like a great hike. Yeah. Um, and that taught me, listen, you know, you, you, you have got capacity within yourself well beyond what you think. Sure. So stop thinking in terms of limits. There, there are no limits. And what did Bruce say? Have no limitation as limitation. But until you confront that, like you're not going to know until you're tested, you're not going to know. That is not uncommon in martial arts in, in terms of philosophy, but it is uncommonly experienced. And so I got it shoved in my face and it changed the way I look at my own training. Oh, this is uncomfortable. I don't want to do it today. Get up, do the thing. And after a while, it just becomes kind of robotic. And it's just, you know, you press play on your brain and you go and do the thing. Um, it has not always been a good influence though, mm -hmm. because sometimes I can be not as plugged into other people as maybe I need to be. I mean, I at least have the self-awareness that that's a thing, but sometimes I forget that they're not me. You know, they have more capacity than they realize. I do. And when, when some of my students start saying, oh, ow, pain, hardship, and then I'm better at it now. I, I didn't used to be, but I used to be, I'd be like, I, I would have to physically switch something in my brain to care. I'm like, no, do the thing. You're capable of better. You're keep, get after it. Yep. Now I'm like, oh, okay. They're, they haven't been pushed to that point yet. Let's ratchet it back a little bit and let's help them work to that point. So, you know, it, it both, both the positive and negative have, have, I feel improved, uh, my personal training and the way I present things to the people that train with me. How do you choose what you teach? At first, I, I usually don't. Most of my students come to me because they want to do Tai Chi. Okay. Tai Chi. Um, and I, I love our, I love our Tai Chi. I love it so much. It's in my skin. Um, Ling Yun Pai is our organization mm -hmm. and Tai Chi Tran is what Chen Pan Ling was most noted for uh, Chen Penling is the is the founder of our lineage. Mm -hmm. His son Chen Yun Ching was my teacher's teacher. My teacher was Chen Yun, Chen Yun Ching's disciple. I am my teacher's disciple, and this is like mm -hmm. it's what I'm all about. And so most of them come to me because they just want to do Tai Chi because of reasons. And so I'm like, cool, we'll start there, and then we see where it goes. Mm -hmm. And some people express more interest in other things. They want to learn more about this or something, something over here. Sometimes I've kind of imposed that and said, hey, I see you struggling with thing over here. Let me show you thing over here. This will help inform you. And then you'll understand this and this will start going someplace. Um, so like I have, I have three classes on Saturdays. Uh, the first one is straight martial arts oriented. It's about the martial aspect of it. Then the second class is just Tai Chi for whoever comes. Then the third class is just an open training. We just do whatever. And I let my students tell me. Like, what, what do you want to know? What do I have that I can give you? Because just because I have all of it doesn't mean they want all of it. And just because I have, and 
have all of it. Boy, that's, that's cocky. Just because I have what I have doesn't mean they want to have everything I have. And just because I think they may benefit from a thing, well, who am I to say? Maybe they're not interested in that thing. And so I just, I, I don't even look at my, my students as my students. They're people I share time with, people I share information with. I don't teach them. The material teaches them. I share choreography. I share theory and ideas. Go train. You're going to put it together. You're going to understand it how you understand it. And so I let them come to me and go, hey, I have a hole here. I'm not sure how to, how to address this. And then we kind of work through it. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a very dictatorial teacher. Not anymore. When, when did that shift start? Was that, was that conscious or was it a lot of the things you've talked about today have been clear in hindsight, but I'm wondering if that might've been one that was the, the first school I was in. And this is one of the things that I absolutely adored about that school and still do. And I still credit the teacher for his incredible ability to organize information. We had a very distinct curriculum. Our tests were, were very specific. What you needed to know was on every test. And it wasn't, oh, just no forms one through three here. And the next test, no, four through six. No, it was all cumulative. Mm -hmm. The higher you went, the more you had to know. Mm -hmm. And there were portions of more senior tests where it was just like, you know, uh, instructor's choice. You better, you better have it all clean because they're going to ask something out of the blue. There were other parts that you knew to prepare for. I love that. I think it benefits a student to have a solid curriculum that starts someplace and then provides you with a syllabus for progression. Oh, it's right. almost crazy. Like we actually do that in real education. Who knew? But traditional martial arts are not, uh, we don't live in a dangerous society like we used to. Mm -hmm. Not everybody wants to be a fighter. Not everybody's in martial arts because they want to fight. So I say, okay, well, what are you here for? What are you trying to get out of this? This started probably, I don't know. 15, 20 years ago, even when I was in the first school that I was in, um, and has, and has really gotten to the point now where unless someone shows that they really want, they want the whole package, then I'm just like, here, take, take what you need. Mm -hmm. You're going to be with me for however long you're with me. You're going to walk this path as long as you need to walk it. Once you've gotten from it, what you need, it's likely that you're going to depart. So let me give you what you want. Let me give you what you need from this from this walk that you and I are sharing. And you don't see that as well, I want to make sure I'm not saying this in a judgmental way. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm channeling others. You don't see that as a failure on your part as an instructor that they depart. No, because I mean, I drive a Jeep right now. Right now I drive a Jeep. Maybe I won't drive a Jeep forever. Is that a failure of the Jeep Corporation to keep me in a Jeep? No, I changed my mind. I moved on. I wanted something different. As, as an instructor, it's my job to present material to students. Students make the choice to come to us in the first place. Life still exists outside of the school. Their lives may no longer be conducive for whatever reason, to remaining in training. Should we feel hurt by that? Because they have a life? Because, we're, because they're, they're not cult members dedicated to the cult? No. Did they have a good experience? If one of us wins, we all win. And if they had a good experience with us, maybe they'll return when life allows it. Maybe they won't. Maybe they'll go someplace else. Maybe they've moved. And so the, the first school they were in is no longer an option. My teacher school is in Frederick, Maryland. I am not in Frederick, Maryland, so I can't go to class. I, I try to go back, but that's big muscle movement to make that happen, especially with three years of pandemic going on. Um, so I, I'm, not, I'm not upset if students leave. I mean, I am because because I miss them. Right. But that's their path they're walking. It's not my job to keep them in class. It's my job to make sure that they got something useful out of the training. What does that mean? Did they learn how to fight? Good. Is that what they wanted? Did they learn how to improve their health? Did they improve something in their life? If I did, I did my job. Whether that's two weeks, two years, 
20 years. Mm. However long you walked with me, I just want it to be good. Mm. There are a lot of instructors out there who see every departing student as a failure. And I've, I've never been able to articulate why that didn't seem right, but you're, from a, you're expressing it in a really, from really a corporate way. perspective, it is from a business perspective. It is every customer you lose is money out the door. I get it. I get it. I teach for free. I don't have to worry about it. My students, uh, we all, I pay, my students pay. We all collectively contribute to pay the rent on the hall that we rent. Mm -hmm. That's it. Sifu, how much do we have to pay? How much can you afford? Well, I'm a little short this month, Sifu. Okay, then I guess it's coming out of my pocket. And so be it. Because I'm here to help you. If it was a business, I get it. You need income. I get it. I get it. No hate. I don't have that. So my job is to make their walk good. Yeah. Your why is lined up with how you teach, what, when, mm -hmm. where. And, and, and that's, you know, I, I keep coming back to that. In, in every aspect, if you don't understand your why, if you're not clear on your why, it leaves a lot of room for a lot of things to not go right. Yeah. And I think there are a lot of martial arts schools out there where they would be better served having fewer classes mm -hmm. and a full-time job. Yeah. Because yeah. then they would be more lined up with their why. Well, and not to put too fine a point on it, if, if you're teaching and you, you have a school, you're teaching and you're recruiting students because you're trying to pay your own salary and your own rent and your own food bill, what's going to happen to the quality of the instruction? Because at some point, you're going to have to make a choice mm -hmm. between how well you teach and how well you profit mm -hmm. because they don't always go together. And it is very difficult to keep those two separate. Yes, yes. And again, no hate. It's a business decision. And it doesn't mean that people can't do it well. No, not at all. Not at all. It's possible. It's also very common though, for people to screw it up mm -hmm. and they given start, enough time, yeah. everybody's going to screw it up at one point. Sure. And, and some of them just make a profession out of it. Um, they got locked in contracts where the student can't cancel them no matter what happens in life. Um, and I see that in the office that I work in, mm -hmm. I've seen that happen with local martial arts schools where I have a soldier's family that by federal government orders are moving to another part of the country. And that school's like, well, you've got a contract. Really? Really? That's how you're going to be. Do you have a person serving the, in, the, in the military, a person serving the armed forces and their family has to depart with them. And you're going to say, I'm sorry, you've got a contract. You have to pay me hundred bucks a month for student for tuition. Come on now. It's, it's ridiculous. I understand you got a business. But this is this is a high risk business, you know. Don't don't come into it unless you can unless you can survive. So, no, I hear you. Just looking at the time, no, no worries. This, this went fast. It did. It did. See, you had plenty to say. You kept it. You kept it easy. Made it easy for me. That's my job. It is, but you do you do it well. Thank you. Thank you. I, I kind of like that we have background music, right? That's good stuff. It's probably showing up a little bit on the mic, and that, that's not that's not a bad thing. You know, it's um, it helps you on the outro. It, it does. Well, you know, I, I I love I love this building. I love this space. It's yeah. so it's so alive, and, and it's not even a martial arts class going on. It's a dance class, and, and I I think I think that's so cool. Just the energy in this space, and that's probably part of why the energy is so good. Is that yeah. they use it for so many different great yeah. things. Yeah, this place is awesome. I was really impressed. Really a lot of fun. If people want to get a hold of you. Um, do, do they have to, you know, do they have to hunt? Do they have to track down the yeah? I don't, the, I don't. The, the two inch sticker that you've hidden, you know, on the underside of a something, and you've got to ask the right person. <laughs> you got to and... go to the right Motel Six, get the correct room, and look under the ashtray, and then there's a sticker. Um, no, so I, I have a Facebook page, Three Lakes Kung Fu and Tai Chi. Um, that's probably the easiest way. My oh. email address is uh, Waling Yun Pai W A Washington. W A Ling Yun Pai L I N G Y U N P A I at Gmail. Oh, I thought it was gonna be something like I have all of the answers. <laughs> dot No. No. Trust me at <laughs> something. You know, you know, I may I may just go make that email address just for fun. I'm sure somebody has it. They probably do. Mine will be like six. 
<laughs> if only it was number six. It's going to be. I, I don't, <laughs> is the the more like six seventy eight. As 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 I've I've heard said, Western mathematics can't adequately express this number. Right. It's one of those. You're probably right. This has been fun. I enjoyed I'm it. really glad I got to meet you. And, and um, I'm stoked. I got to meet you. Yeah. I've been listening to your podcast for a couple of years. I'm like, well, thank you. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you know, when, when, when the roster was getting put together for the event, um, you were a bit of a wild card as it was brought to me. It was, there's this guy and he wants to come and he teaches at JBLM and we don't know anything about him. I was like, cool. It'll work out or it won't. And I, I, I joked with Kathy yesterday. I said, you know, I'm not a somebody. I know some somebodies. I'm just a nobody. I just hang out. And I do my thing and I help people as much as I can. I've been very fortunate to have some incredible teachers. Um, By the I, way, Kathy is Kathy Long. Yeah, Kathy Long. I get to call her Kathy. Um, and and the, the, the absolute luck I've had in meeting people. Yeah. Um, I was I was fanboying like crazy yesterday with Kathy and Ristina here, cool. and then and and I, how do you think I, I felt? I, I got past my fanboying about you <laughs> when I saw your name on the thing, right? Um, I've known I've known Rusty for like twenty years, but I, I don't get to see her. Yeah. And I've known Cat for a couple of years, and I don't get to see her. And so yesterday I was just like, oh my god, Jeremy's here and Cat's here and Rusty's here. It was just it was overwhelming for me. Um, I, I just absolutely loved it. It was fantastic. Well, thank, thanks for being part of it. What? Um, to the audience, reminder, you know, whistlekick.com. If, if you want to get as much notice on these events as possible, you know, get on the newsletter list. You know, we try to let people know as we have this stuff going and it won't be long before we're putting together dates for 2024. Uh, whistlekickmarshmartsradio.com and at whistlekick everywhere and, and all that. So I appreciate Do you it. being here. Do it. The only person you're cheating is you. How do you want to close up? What do you want to tell me? Um, train. Train humbly. Um, train with passion. Follow what interests you um, and make it a part of your life and reach out to other people because without connections, there is no community. With no community, why are you doing it? 